Hello and welcome to worship with Dunwoody United Methodist Church. My name is Calissa Dodderman. I am one of the associate pastors here and I am so glad that you're tuning in for this sermon. This week we are hearing from Reverend Matt Stone about the concept of forgiveness and the story of David. And we're rounding out our worship series, What Are You Chasing? Just a quick word, if you're hoping to see our full online worship experience, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. We are now live streaming our in-person worship services each week. You can catch our contemporary worship service at 9 a.m. or our traditional worship service at 11.15 a.m. Both of those can be accessed through our homepage at dunwoodyumc.org or on our live stream page. So friends, let's worship together as we hear this good word from Reverend Matt Stone. Good morning and welcome to DUMC yet again. My name is Matt Stone. I'm one of the pastors here. And as the summer winds to a close, our summer series about David, King David, is also drawing to a close. But I got to confess to you that the way that this story, this series closes, frankly, is a little brutal. I mean, it's kind of a difficult story. And it's the kind of story that, um, that's unexpected because we've spent so much of the summer following this narrative trajectory of David that kind of mirrors, I don't know, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos, right? It's this narrative trajectory that's headed to the moon and it looks like everything is going right and nothing could possibly go wrong. Think about the story that we've shared over the last uh, several weeks. Uh, we heard about David as a man after God's own heart. We heard about David being anointed the next king of Israel, chosen by God to be the next king of Israel. We heard about David defeating Goliath we heard about David making a best friend out of his enemy's son. We heard about David becoming the king, recapturing the Ark of the Covenant, establishing Jerusalem as the capital, and receiving an eternal promise, a promise of eternal love and a promise of an eternal kingdom from God. And we heard last week about David reflecting that love that he's received from God in the way that he treats the people around him. Specifically last week, we took a look at Mephibosheth. This trajectory has been headed only one direction or so it seems. His star is the brightest star in Israel's history until at least Jesus. And that's not really a fair comparison. But all of that makes it all the more surprising when we when we encounter chapter 11 in 2 Samuel. We just don't see coming the incredible fall that David takes. I sometimes think about David's story as peaks and valleys. And this week we finally see that David falls into a deep and dark valley. Now the story that we're looking at this week with David and Bathsheba is one that many of us are not familiar with. But those of us who are familiar with the story, if I'm being honest, I think we're at a bit of a disadvantage. The reason we're at a disadvantage is that we have a mental sketch of the story that unfolds between David and Bathsheba. And that mental sketch begins with David on the roof, on the roof spotting Bathsheba, a beautiful woman on another rooftop. That's where our story begins for those of us who are familiar with it. The problem is that's not the beginning of the story. And when we begin that story with David already on the roof, frankly, it leads us into a too great of a temptation to follow an old and frankly, patriarchal interpretation of this story that tries to blame Bathsheba. Oh, you know, David was just trying to be a good guy, but Bathsheba really was the problem here. When we begin the story with David on the roof, it's too easy to fall into what I would call a lazy interpretation of what is actually happening between David and Bathsheba. So for us this morning, we're not going to take the easy way out. We're going to start at the very beginning of the story. We're not going to start midstream. 
We're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 11 in 2 Samuel. If you want to follow along with me today, we'll be in chapters 11 and 12. Listen to the first line. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. That's where our story begins. Did you catch it? In the springtime of the year, when kings go out to battle, David stayed home. I think one of the key lessons that comes out of this, narr- out of this story is in the very first verse. When we forget who we are, when we refuse to be who God called us and made us to be, it leads us invariably down a road that ends in pain. It ends in rebellion. It ends with us not being who God made us to be. This story would be dramatically different if David had simply been the king that God made him to be. But in the springtime, when kings go to war, David stayed home. Now the familiar story for some of us between David and Bathsheba unfolds. David goes up on the roof one afternoon. It's uh, typically cooler on the roof in ancient Israel. And so he goes up there and as he is uh, on his high perch, he spots a beautiful woman on a rooftop not too far away and her name is Bathsheba. David sends some of his uh, palace guards to find out who is that And they come back and they tell him, this is Bathsheba. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sends his guards back and they take Bathsheba to David in his palace. And the two of them lay together and conceive a child. And Bathsheba sends word, I'm pregnant. And then we see really three efforts on David's part. Three efforts to cover up what has happened. We see from David not what we would expect. What we would expect based on what we've heard from David so far, what we would expect is for David to to repent. We, We expect for David to see his error and to return to God and to do the right thing. But that's the exact opposite of what David does in this moment. That's part of why this story is so jarring. We expect so much from David. And in this story, he fails us at every turn. David's first attempt at cover-up is to bring Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. He, He brings Uriah home from a battle. Uriah is away fighting for Israel. Uriah went went with Joab to fight Israel's battle. And so David brings Uriah home. And his hope is that in bringing Uriah back to Jerusalem, Uriah would go and have some, let's say, quality time with his wife Bathsheba. And nobody would know then when Bathsheba was discovered to be pregnant, nobody would know that it was actually Uriah's child. But Uriah, the Hittite, which by the way means he's a Gentile, not a Jew. He's not one of God's people. He's fighting for God's people, but he's not a Jewish man. This is not one of Abraham's descendants. This is somebody who's a Gentile. This Gentile has more honor than David and says, I won't go home to my wife while my comrades in arms, while my brothers in the, on the field of battle are still out there. And so David's second plan of cover-up unfolds, and he decides the next day, okay, well, well, I'll just get Uriah drunk. And that way he'll make some bad decisions, and everybody will assume this then is Uriah's child. But, and so that unfolds. Uh, David does get Uriah drunk, but even a drunk Uriah is more faithful than David in this story. Even a drunk Gentile Uriah knows better than David. And so David resorts to plan three. David sends a letter with Uriah back to the front lines. And David's letter contains the order to Joab, David's general, to put Uriah at the point of the heaviest fighting. And when things get really hot in that battle, David tells Joab, pull the other guys back so that Uriah will die in battle. It's one of those moments in scripture that takes you completely off guard. We just don't expect to see David murder Uriah the Hittite to cover up his own act of adultery. It's a stunning, stunning moment. Joab then sends word back to David. 
Hey, David, your orders have been carried out. The deed is done. Uriah is dead. David sends for Bathsheba after her period of lamentation, brings Bathsheba into his house, marries her as his own wife, and the two conceive, the two have a son together. What we hear in this part of the story is absolutely tragic. And I want to be clear, this is not a part of our story as the people of God that we like to dwell on. But the reality that we cannot escape is that sin has a gravitational pull to it. Do you hear how many people are are pulled into the orbit of destruction that is David's sin? There is something about our own brokenness that tends to pull others down with us. First, it's just David. And then David pulls his guards into it by sending them to retrieve Bathsheba. And then Bathsheba is a part of the story. And then Uriah is a part of the story. And then Joab is a part of the story. And then Joab's men are part of the story. And then Joab's messenger is a part of the story. There is a gravitational pull to David's sin that we can't ignore We have to confront the reality that that while sin for most of us and most often is a personal pursuit, its impact is overwhelmingly communal. David's failure to be who God made him to be pulls his entire community into his sinful behavior, into his own sin. Friends, we're not going to dwell on sin this morning. I grew up Methodist and Methodists aren't eager to dwell on sin, but we do need to pause long enough to confront the reality that when we run from who God made us to be, when we run from the life that God calls us to live, people are hurt, right? We we sin against God and the people around us. And so David believes that he's gotten away with the story. He believes he's gotten away with the whole ruse. He thinks that nobody knows. But but the last verse, the last line of chapter 11 marks a turning point. It says this, but the thing, it's a very simple statement. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I hope that is never a sentence that's uttered about me. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. God, it turns out David has has succeeded in hiding this from everybody around him, but he hasn't hidden it from God himself. God sends the prophet Nathan. And Nathan, we haven't seen a whole lot of Nathan up to this point, but God sends Nathan to confront David. Can you imagine from Nathan's perspective, I don't want to do that. You want me to go tell the king that he's done something wrong? That feels like a danger to me. But Nathan goes, and he's brilliant in the way that he confronts David in his sin. And I hope this is a story that all of us can learn from, for what it means to hold somebody that we love accountable to the life that God called them and made them to live. David, uh, or Nathan begins by telling David a story. He says, uh, you know, there's there's a rich man and there's a poor man. He tells him a parable. He says this rich man has, uh, has plenty, so many sheep, so many goats, he's got plenty. The poor man, however, had only one sheep, but he loved that sheep dearly, treated it as one of his own kids. And one day a traveler shows up on the doorstep of the rich man, but the rich man doesn't want to uh, offer one of his own sheep or one of his own goats to feed this traveler. And so instead he goes down and he steals the lamb from the poor man and, um, and offers that to his traveler. And David, listening to the parable, erupts in self-righteous indignation. He, He just erupts on it. And David says, who is this guy? This guy deserves to die at the very least, David says. He's got to repay the poor man fourfold because he had so much. And yet he took from the poor man. And Nathan, in this moment that just brings the narrative to a stop, Nathan immediately says, you are the man. Nathan uses a parable to point out to David exactly the nature of what he's done. And Nathan goes on, he says, the Lord has given you so much, David. The Lord has done so much for you, David. And he would have done even more. And yet you have scorned the Lord. This is what Nathan tells David on God's behalf. 
And at the very end of this absolutely painful, painful moment where Nathan is pointing out in painful detail every one of David's failures at the end of it, this is what David says. And it's a little tricky because it's so short. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And that's it. We don't hear David's apology. We don't hear David's understanding of what's going on. We don't hear David explaining how he got here. It is a simple statement. I have sinned against the Lord. And friends, I think this is a pattern for us, or it ought to be a pattern for us, not just in how we deal with God, but this is a pattern for how we deal with each other. Right, David's being set up as a contrast to Saul. If you remember back early in this series, we heard about King Saul who failed to do what God asked him to do and made excuse after excuse for why he didn't do uh, what he was asked to do, for why he was disobedient to God's will. But David in this moment doesn't make an excuse. He, he doesn't try to avoid his own sin. He doesn't try to pass responsibility to somebody else. Well, you know, it was probably Bathsheba's fault because she was there and she was looking pretty. What is it, what's a guy supposed to do? David doesn't do any of that. He simply and immediately takes responsibility for himself. Friends, I think about how much pain we could avoid in our relationships with those especially whom we love the most if we would simply and immediately take responsibility when we know that we've done wrong. And the same is true in our relationship with God. If we would simply and immediately confess when we know that we have gone wrong. Fr friends, may we all be so blessed as David. May we all be so blessed as David to have somebody like Nathan in our lives who can come to us and tenderly and yet forcefully point out to us when we have wandered down a path that we have no business being on. But too many of us wait for the consequences of our sin to become so overwhelming that then we, th then we can't help but escape our own blindness, right? For, for a lot of us, we don't have a Nathan in our lives. And so we don't see our sin until the consequences of, that own, of our own brokenness become so overwhelming that we can't be blind to them anymore. May we all be so fortunate as David to have a Nathan in our lives. David from this moment understands that the consequences of his actions will remain. But listen to Nathan's response. When David says, I have sinned against the Lord, listen to Nathan's response. Nathan said to David, this is in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Nathan said to David, now the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. Isn't it remarkable? Now the Lord has put away, that's a, a, another way of saying forgiven. The Lord has forgiven your sin. Death is not part of the consequences of your sin. He says, nevertheless, because by this deed you've utterly scorned the Lord, the child that's born to you shall die. David doesn't escape the consequences of his sin, but... God refuses to abandon David in this moment. David's sin has not ruined him. And brothers and sisters, uh, for those of us, when we read this story too often, we can't make it to the end because we start thinking about our own sin and we start thinking about our own guilt and we become overwhelmed with shame. If that's where you are in this minute, I need you to hear in this moment what happens to David. God refuses to abandon David. Even in the midst of murder and adultery and lying and deceit, even in the midst of all that, God is still eager to forgive David. It doesn't mean the consequences go away. It doesn't mean that everything is magically made wonderful again. But it does mean that as David travels down the road through the, the, the road of the consequences of his sin, he doesn't travel that road alone. God goes with him still. Hear that word of gospel, brothers and sisters. If you are overwhelmed by shame, if you know what it's like to be overwhelmed by guilt or to be overwhelmed by the, the brokenness that, that we experience, know also the grace of God that goes with us into that dark place. Know also the words of Nathan to the King David. 
The Lord has put away your sin, and you shall not die. In that moment, David begins a process of repentance. And he offers himself, he fasts and he prays and he cries out to God. But at the end of it, and this is where I want to end this morning, at the end of all of it, David rises, he washes himself, he anoints himself, he changes clothes, he goes to worship, and then he sits down to eat a meal after this long fast. At the end of all of it, David refuses to dwell in his sin. And I think that's a mistake that so many of us make. So many of us dwell in a place where we continue to to abuse ourselves for the ways that we have fallen down in the past. So many of us, we refuse to move on. It's not just, it's not that we haven't asked for forgiveness. It's not that we haven't confessed our sin. It's that we won't forgive ourselves and we dwell in our sin. We are held captive by our sin. But what we hear in David's story is that he's not held captive by it. The consequences are absolutely gut-wrenching, but he's not held captive by his sin. He is not ruined by his sin because the Lord continues to walk with him. Friends, this is a brutal way to end this series. It's where I started this morning, but it's a brutal way to end this series because this story is so jarring. It's so, so far removed from what we expect based on what we've heard of David's life. And so it's a painful way to end on the one hand. On the other hand, There's a piece of me that appreciates this story deeply. Why do you think the author of 2 Samuel left that story in there? If you're you're writing a story about the greatest king in Israel's history, why would you include that story? We don't have an exact answer to that, but I have a suspicion. I, I think that it's, at least in part, because up to this point, we've heard so many good things about David We have an image of David floating above the earth. He's not really human. He's floating above the earth. He's too good. He's too great to be one of us. And yet this story, with profound effect, reminds us that David is just like us. Maybe our sins aren't David's sins. Maybe our sins aren't murder and adultery or deceit. But David was broken like you and I are broken. And if God can use a man like David, who who does all of that, then maybe, maybe God could use us. If God can love a man who does all of that, then maybe, maybe God might still love us. Friends, sin is not the definition of who we are. We are defined not by our brokenness, We are defined by God's love and grace. That's what we hear in David's story. In the rise and the fall of David, we hear about a God who goes with us through the great times and through the awful times. In the rise and the fall of David, we hear a gospel story of resurrection. We hear a gospel story of forgiveness. We hear a gospel story of covenant and everlasting love. David and Bathsheba is a difficult way to end. But I find myself being grateful because in David's story, I recognize my own. And if God can love David, maybe God can love me. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks this morning for all of David's story. Even the most painful of parts, we are grateful, O Lord, that we can remember the ways that you worked through David, that we can remember the ways that, that David worked for you. I'm grateful that we can remember both David's successes and David's failures and learn from them. Help us to be who you called us to be. Help us to be who you made us to be. Oh God, in those moments when we are tempted to forget ourselves, when we are tempted to forget our own identity, I pray that you would shake us awake. 
that you would awaken us to your presence in our lives, that you would awaken us to your love in our lives, that you would awaken us to the gift that is life with you. Oh God, we pray all this in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.